Okay, I, um, I think we're ready to begin. I, I'll, I can, I'm Janine Castella Lynn, um, Vice President of the Berkeley Historical Society. And um, welcome everyone for joining us for um, a look back at the 70s and early 80s in Berkeley, a very uh, interesting time. Um, and uh, I'm gonna turn the mic over to Lincoln Cushing who's gonna say a word about David Munstock and um, the archives um, and this program. So you can go ahead, Lincoln. Thank you, Janine. Um, welcome to this program on this beautiful Sunday. Um, the Berkeley Historical Society is hosting this as part of an exhibition that just went up yesterday. If you haven't had a chance to see it, it'll be up for several months. Please check it out. And it's based on the collection of a fellow named David Munstock, who um, is a, a, an amazing fellow. Uh, he came, his father emigrated from Nazi Germany and met up with his mother, who was a Lithuanian refugee in Canada. And David was born in Canada. And when he was a young child, they moved to San Francisco. And he's been in the Bay Area ever since. Um, David went to UC Berkeley starting in 1966 and became swept up in a lot of the ferment that was going on at the time. Um, he got in very involved in, in political organizations then, but his, his biggest commitment was about the electoral process itself. He really felt that getting people to vote and getting people to engage in elections was his big contribution. Um, he became a lawyer. He went to Bolt Law School. And partly the reason he went to law school is because he felt that would be a good tool for helping with his chosen avocation, which was political work. He, early on, um, even before he passed the bar, he started working as an administrative assistant to the city council. Um, but his day job for many years was with the California Energy Commission. But his commitment to Berkeley politics went very deep. Um, he was very engaged in many of the campaigns. Um, around 1977, he backed off somewhat and became more involved with some of his other life interests, which included world travel. But I met David when I was working at Inkworks, which was a worker-owned press in Berkeley, um, which printed a lot of the campaign material. And when I was cataloging a lot of the, the stuff, he was clearly the go-to guy to understand what was happening in Berkeley elections from you know, the late 60s on. We became pretty close friends around the subject of political posters and such. And before he died, he invited me over to his house and said, there's a bunch of materials I've got in my house. I'd like you to know where they are. Someday they'll come to you. Well, that day came to me uh, just about a year ago, August of last year. And I got notice that he passed away. So I went over to his house and spent hours digging things out of his, from under his bed and in cabinets and under the eaves of his house, gathered all the materials, processed it, and then realized that the best place for it would be the Berkeley Historical Society. So turned it over to the Berkeley Historical Society. It's a rich trove of material. It's boxes and boxes of fine details about everything about city council meetings, election results. Um, he detailed all this stuff and it's all now at the Berkeley Historical Society. So it's a trove for researchers. We quickly mounted this exhibition, which you see right now. And it's, it's just the tip of the iceberg. We cover some of the features of his content, but there's a lot of material that has not been revealed at all in this exhibition. And we're hoping that more can be revealed through conversations like we're having today. We've got three former mayors and one activist. We're gonna be talking to you from their points of view as to what makes Berkeley a unique and special place on the political landscape. So there will be, if you wanna ask questions, please put them into the chat. There will be an opportunity for those questions to be vetted and answered. Everybody will get a chance to say something, but thank you all for joining us today. Um, I'm going to leave it to the next person here who's going to introduce Gus Newport. All right. Hi. Thank you very much, Lincoln. Um, so uh, Gus, as many of you know, um, 
was mayor of Berkeley, two-term mayor of Berkeley from 1979 through 1986. Um, and he's also worked in international peace, social justice and civil rights, um, both before his uh, mayoral terms and after. Um, he was vice president for the U.S. Peace Council, amongst many other um, important uh, roles. So welcome very much, Gus. Um, you're now residing in Oakland, but uh, that's, that's close enough. Right next and, door, I'm in Rockland. Oh, you're, you're, rock, you're almost, almost Berkeley. And I appreciate you being here because I, I understand that uh, you just came back from a four-day uh, conference up in Seattle. So, so thank you for for hopping on this Zoom call. Um, so you, you, you did have a very interesting um, political life before you came to Berkeley in the 70s. So maybe you'd like to share with the audience um, what experiences and people in your earlier years influenced you to work on issues of peace and social justice? Well, I was born in Rochester, New York, 1935 during the Depression. And, uh, my family on my mother's side had moved from Virginia to Pittsburgh and then to Rochester. My grandmother decided to get out of Virginia because of the racism that she felt. Uh, when she was in the fourth grade, she went to school late one day after picking cotton. She walked in to the classroom and the white teacher slapped her without asking a question. My grandmother walked out, never went back to school, but she became an avid reader. And then they got married young. She got married at 16. And when she and her husband got married, they were, had their little wedding, were going on their little two-day honeymoon and were arrested by the Ku Klux Klan and the police department where she lived in jail and they took all her presents. So she then decided to get out of the South and move to Pittsburgh where she had cousins, then to Rochester, New York, where she had a sister. As I said, I was born in 1935 and she started taking me to see Paul Robeson and Marion Anderson when I was five years old. And our church, which was run by a fellow named Charles Body, took myself and another fellow in our neighborhood at the age of 12 and put us on a debate team and took us all across the state of New York, debating with other uh, black youth, different church, about the conditions of the world, slavery, going back to 16, 17 and whatever. So this sort of stuff all prepared me to be very much involved in the civil rights movement beginning in the 60s. I got drafted in 1958 after I dropped out of college and was released in 1960 and came back and civil rights was in full swing. Matter of fact, Rochester was one of two cities that had two race rides. The Kerner Commission came to interview me twice. And so then Malcolm X came there and Daisy Bates who integrated Little Rock, Arkansas introduced Malcolm and I and Malcolm, once I couldn't stay in Rochester because of my relationship with him, I went to New York ended up working in Harlem. And I traveled with Malcolm four days before he was assassinated back to Rochester where he spoke at Colgate Divinity. So a whole variety of things. I first came to Berkeley in the late 60s. I was working with the United States Research and Development Corporation which when Ron Dellum was first running for office to look at job development thing. And then I went to work later for the US Department of Labor in Puerto Rico in the Virgin Islands doing community and economic development. And when I came, left the Department of Labor during the Reagan years, of uh, Nixon years, nobody wanted to be connected to government. I then, my cousin asked me to come back to Berkeley and help set up a youth employment services program. One thing led to another. I was a senior fellow on the city of Berkeley staff for a while, even before I went back to work in the Department of Labor. And then people from BCA started asking me to run it from there and I never won thought about being a politician, didn't want to, and at first I said no, but we went through some changes. Okay. Happened. Yeah. So you you're you're um you're anticipating my next question, which was going to be what motivated you to run for mayor in 1979. It sounds like you other people kind of drafted you. Yeah, I wasn't so motivated, but I mean being a part of the movement to bring justice to the shores of the United States. You know, we claim to be a democracy, but we have a military budget right now that if you cut it by 85%, it would be a greater budget than all the rest of the budgets of militarism and all the rest of the countries in the world put together. 
And so it was like pursuing peace. Berkeley was a place that looked at, you know, the student body, the people who lived here, citizens or whatever else. And so it was a natural because politics is a part of it. Public policy is meant to change some of the practices that go on, that go anywhere from our tax dollars going to underwrite wars to have an affordable housing, good schools. I mean, just looking at this pandemic moment we went through recently, look at what parents have had to go through, maintaining children, trying to keep them in school and educate them and whatever else. All these things are integral to what is political and what needs to be changed in our society. You, you also mentioned when we were speaking about redlining. Well, yes, redlining is, is a practice that's gone on forever in this country. I think about the days going back when they created the projects. And when FDR was, uh, was elected, you know, he brought in the New Deal, but he had to acquiesce to the Southern senators and people too in order to get that passed. And they built in red lines into the banking system, et cetera, whatever else, which is still being practiced to this day. You know, so few Americans know about what our political system really is. We're 43rd in the world in literacy and education, 72nd in healthcare. And our education system is actually going backwards. I mean, little things I remember when I was a youngster in grammar school, they taught music, they taught us ballroom dancing, tap dancing, the arts along with chemistry and Latin and all other kinds of things. We greatly dwindled that. Since we took education out of health, education, and welfare, just created an education department, which basically says just train, train youngsters now to pass exams and things like that, but it doesn't allow the creativity that it once was. So yeah, I mean, interaction and having an analysis of all these things would drive you to politics. So let's face it, our politics leaves a lot to be desired too. I mean, look at what just happened in, in Virginia where we didn't expect uh, the Republican to win, but what happened, Charlie wasn't speaking to what the people wanted to hear about education and stuff for their children just coming out of this pandemic time. And if we don't hear the people and listen to them and engage them through that which is necessary, then this is what you end up with. Thank you. Um, so looking back on your time as mayor, what projects or initiatives are you most proud of? Well, as I said, uh, we had an initiative on the ballot when I was running for office to divest from South Africa. And Berkeley became the first city in the United States to divest from South Africa. Our rent control went all the way to the Supreme Court. Marty and others will certainly remember that. We got Lawrence Tribe, who was in the law school at Harvard, to try it for us, and we wanted rent control in in Supreme Court. A uh, post Prop 13. As a matter of fact, when I got I got elected, when Prop 13 was passed, and of course you had to, anything you passed and had to have two thirds of the vote of the citizens pass. So one of the things we looked at early on was full funding of our libraries because with the two library systems we had in Berkeley, UC, and our our library as well as there were 100 bookstores, people love to read. So we put that on the ballot and passed with like almost 80% of the vote. Um, there was a big disability movement here, Judy Human and Ed and others. And we made curve cuts so that people in wheelchairs could get from the street up onto the sidewalks and that get sensitive things, what people need. Affordable housing was something that we always, uh, um, uh, Marty and others and BCA and places were very concerned about affordable housing. In those days, we were constantly creating general plans and master plans and state plans and things like that to try to get most affordable housing. Of course, we're still behind in affordable housing in Berkeley. Um, we, uh, we, I remember one of the things we did earlier on, we put an initiative on the ballot to fund child care so that more women could work. And we pass that so that we uh, subsidize that also and whatever else. We reformed our police department because of too much shooting and stuff that was taking place in those days. And one of the things we did is we got mental health workers to work the streets and ride in cars with our police because some of what police were doing wasn't necessary. We also made sure that police were well educated to understand and, 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 and police shooting things like that went down to almost zero. 
in the next 10 years. Uh, we founded during the time I was in office the Berkeley Health Department because we recognized with mental health and this and that and other kinds of things were needed that health was necessary. And we're one of the few cities in California that has its own health department and has maintained that. And that's it. You got to be in touch and in tune with the people to understand what the problems are. And of course, um, I was on the board even before I was elected and worked say, of BCA Berkeley Citizens Action. But one of the things that's interesting, although there was a divide between BCA and Berkeley Democrat Club later to become ABC, there was also a general sense of what was right. And oftentimes we passed legislation together that collectively reflected the same kind of thing. So we, the politics of Berkeley led to, I think, that which is the most, and of course we were looking at community uh, concerns. You know, when we first started putting the pumps in the street where our traffic was coming too heavy because of the danger of the way people were driving and things like that. All that is a response to what the citizens need and, and brought to our attention. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks so much, Gus. So one last question. What words of wisdom would you like to pass on to the, the present or future generation of politicians here in Berkeley? Well, listen to the people. Um, I think first and foremost, as we see now the infighting going on, for instance, going back again, to how long it took to get the Biden package passed, you know, at the federal level and how, how it got cut down based on some of the things we need. We should have a relationship with the university. Through Troy Duster, who founded the Institute for the Study of Social Change, I worked closely with them, and they helped us with data, whatever, but he also generated a breakfast between Michael Heyman, the chancellor, and myself twice, uh, twice a month, and things like that. So although there was some distance between the city and the university, the university is a great place, and it has great assistance to help us, et cetera, and whatever else. I mean, we should be looking at the school system right now, getting out of this, going through this two years, this pandemic time. It is awful what parents have to go through to help children through school and this and that, and much of it was done virally and by Zoom, et cetera, and whatever else. I've been working with groups of people that said, with our various skills, we should assist parents who are friends of ours to help them with their children's needs, et cetera, whatever else. You know, I come out of the movement, beloved community. I knew Martin Luther King as well as Malcolm X, and whatever else. And these are the kinds of things that we should aspire to. It's a society that learns to love and work with one another to create and elevate what our city and our systems and our politics are to the highest level so that people can live, you know, a decent life and whatever else. And coming out of this pandemic time now, it's very, very, very difficult times. And once again, we need to rethink and relook at and look to one another to plan that was in the best interest of all. Thank you. Thank you very much for those, those words of wisdom. All right. Well, our, our 12 minutes, I think, is up. So I'll, I'll pass the, uh, the mic to Lincoln, who's going to ask questions of Lonnie. Thank you very much. It's back to me. Let me give you a brief intro about Lonnie, who moved to Berkeley in 64. And um, she entered the political landscape when she ran for city council in 69. And that she, she's raised issues of rent control, police reform, neighborhood preservation, lim, you know, neighborhood preservation and development. These are all the sort of the backbone of what has been described as the progressive agenda of Berkeley. Um, in 86, she was the first woman to be elected to mayor of Berkeley. And she succeeded Gus. And she served for two terms. Um, she then went on to the California State Assembly, representing the 14th District, and then was elected to the State Senate in 2008. Um, she's been a lifelong committed political servant. And so I'm really glad to have her on, on the team here. And I have a, a couple a question that I'll start off with, which is, you know, elected office is a stressful and usually thankless job. What inspired you to run for city council and mayor back in the day? Well, Lincoln, nothing inspired me. I think I'm a little bit like Gus here. And I was put forward by a movement to represent its ideas. 
And it's a movement that had been going on throughout the 1960s in Berkeley, but really beyond that. You know, in the 1950s, Berkeley had some of the first demonstrations against the House on American Activities Committee. It had civil rights demonstrations. I mean, if you want to go way back in time, we had August Vollmer, the father of community policing uh, back in the 1930s. So I arrived also at a time of ferment in Berkeley, 1964. The school board had voted to be the, one of the first districts in the country to bus to voluntarily integrate schools. And the school board, there was a recall, the school board members. My first week or so in Berkeley, it failed. And I remember thinking, I'm gonna love it here. <laughs> this is a wonderful city uh, for a person with my politics. I grew up in a very liberal household also to Unitarian ministers for parents. But um, this, the recall of the school board members failed. About two months after that, the free speech movement happened on campus. And I got involved in that as many uh, people from town did. A few months after that, the Vietnam Day Committee run by two math professors at UC, um, Steve uh, Smale and um, Mo Hirsch had the, I believe, one of the first anti-war marches in the country, uh, which I obviously took part in. And so I was part of a new community in which people were asking questions all the time and trying to make change. I really credit a bunch of accidents for getting me into politics. Um, Jay Charlin, who some of you may know, who went to parent nursery school with me, um, her daughter and my little daughter were friends, said to me one day, stop complaining against the, uh, against the war and go join Women for Peace. So I did. <laughs> and I ended up working to um, Dow chemical products because of their manufacture of napalm and working on a number of issues like that. Another set of friends said to me a year or so later, stop complaining about the war in Vietnam. Go join the sheer campaign for Congress. Now that I believe was the first electoral campaign in the country by a candidate who was running on a platform of peace in Vietnam and bring the money home to the United States. End poverty. We, one of our slogans was rebuild a corner of America. Think, lo think globally, act locally. There worked very hard in that. When the Shear campaign did not win, although it carried Berkeley, the group that had worked on it decided to stay together and called itself the Community for New Politics. And we ran candid because we were beginning to focus more and more locally, began to run candidates. We ran candidates for the city council, they lost. We ran candidates for Congress, they lost. Finally, um, we did succeed in electing Ron Dellums to Congress and then, um, and that's a whole saga that deserves its own history, believe me. Um, and then um, after that, we joined with some other civic groups. There was a group called the Better Berkeley Council, the CNP, some of the UC students who were fighting the war. Remember, these were dr draftable middle-class boys and they did not want to go and fight in a war based on the colonialist, anti-communist assumptions of, of the Vietnam War. So um, in 1969, we actually approached the Democratic Club and asked them if they would put one of our members on their ticket. And the Democratic Club declined to do that. So I ran by myself. One of the things we learned in that campaign is if there are slates, you can't run one person because the other four votes go to other people. 
So in 1971, when David came on the scene, and I, uh, in 1971, uh, the students from the university and the Better Berkeley Council and the Community for New Politics all gathered together, had a convention of four days in a local school with probably a thousand community members there arguing over the platform, writing the platform. And we ended up running a slate of four people in 1971. Uh, myself, Dearmy Bailey, Ira Simmons, and a graduate student at Cal named Rick Brown. That year, we won three out of four seats. And Rick Brown, who later became a nationally known professor of public health at UCLA, lost to Ed Caldron, the top vote getter on the other ticket uh, by 16 votes. And I always felt like it was a great gift to the state of California and to the field of public health that Rick did not get elected to the Berkeley City Council because he was so active in public policy in the state the whole time I was in the legislature and everything. So um, that is kind of what we built on and went on. And Gus was chosen by a big convention in 1979, I guess, Gus. And um, it, it was a great time. And hopefully it was very policy-based very required commitment to a very diverse group of people. Just like the Democratic Party now, you had electoral people <laughs> in the coalition and you had movement people who and who wanted to compromise and what to do. But um, that's basically how I got into Thanks. elective because my life's work. <laughs> that, that, that's a great answer. And just as a quick follow up here, um, uh, you've you've served at various levels of electoral office, but what do you think are Berkeley's unique challenges and opportunities? Well, I think Berkeley, as I've said, is a place where things begin. And certainly we put Ying Lee and I made the first motions to divest from South Africa, highly contentious, didn't actually happen till Gus was mayor, and I think we did an initiative to make that happen. Many of, the, um, many of the basic ideas we put forward at that time were extremely controversial, and most of them are now mainstream, <laughs> everything. I remember the city attorney telling us it would be illegal for us to fund childcare, and the council finally had to say, okay, Let's test that. We'll fund childcare and see who sues us. And guess what? Nobody did. So, you know, it, a lot of first ideas are Shoreline State Park. Um, and again, the university as both a partner and an opponent, because they have so many legal rights that the city can't contest. But um, I would think our challenge is now are to stay out in front because the world is challenged as never before. Um, you know, can one city play a role in keeping the planet habitable for healthy human life? Can one city pay a role in ending poverty, in educating our kids? Um, my husband, Tom Bates, when he was mayor, did a program called Vision 2020, where they were trying to close the achievement gap in Berkeley and had some success and some not, but it did some pretty amazing work on that. Um, so how do we educate our kids? Um, how do we build an economy based on equity? Um, which means recalibrating a lot of our economic system. And I think Berkeley is still well situated to do that. I'm concerned that because of 
that we can lose some of our diversity because of housing costs. I think we really have to work to maintain what, uh, some, you know, the secret sauce or whatever. <laughs> but uh, but uh, our role is cut out for us. And I say the council is stepping up. It was good to see us um, be the one of the first, if not the first city to say that new kitchens aren't going to have gas stoves. <laughs> Thank you very much, Lonnie. That was really helpful. Okay, I think we're moving on to Shirley Dean. Yes, um, thank you very much. So um, as many of you may know, um, Shirley Dean was uh, in the city council, Berkeley City Council from 1975 to 1982, and again from 86 to 94, and then was a two-term mayor from 94 until 2002. Um, and before that, she started the Bonita Berryman Neighborhood Association and worked to pass the Landmarks Preservation Ordinance in 1974. So welcome, Shirley. Um, and um, I'll, I guess I'll just jump in with your time as a city council person from 1975 to 82. Um, and looking back, what issues loomed large then? And um, are these still big issues today or have some of these been resolved? Surely, I, I, I don't, uh, are, you, are you unmuted? Do you see Shirley? Shirley's not on my screen. I hear you. Can you hear me? Okay, yes, I see and hear you. Uh -huh. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your introduction. Um, Berkeley didn't have a landmarks preservation ordinance. And when they tore two historic buildings down on the block that I lived on, um, I thought I'd better get busy and uh, change that. So I worked along with many others from the Planning Commission in 1972 to my first term on the council in 1975 to develop a strong ordinance. It survived multiple council efforts to weaken or ignore it through the years after I left office. Today, the People's Park issue is in the forefront. Will UC build housing there, destroying the open space itself and ignoring its history and adversely impacting the multitude of landmarks that surround it? Or will it be given historic recognition is the decision that lies yet to, yet to be made. The second thing that uh, I remember so um, from that term, from that uh, uh, time of history, was the recall of Diarmi Bailey. Bailey, who barely met the 90-day residency requirement in Berkeley to run for office, was selected as part of a council slate. He was elected and about two years later was recalled in a hard, bitter campaign led by Wilmot Sweeney, who went on to become a very respected judge. But that hard, bitter campaign deepened the strong political divisions that affected so much of the future actions in the city. The third one was the 1975 firefighter strike. As a novice council member, I was appointed to the three-person negotiation team to settle this strike. And I found myself sitting in hotel uh, rooms overnight with men I barely knew. And I laugh at the memory of my husband crossing the picket line of firefighters in front of my home so he could join his own Berkeley School District picket line. However, the fourth uh, item was the traffic management plan. Since I came from the planning commission that developed the plan, much of the hostility about the plan was directed at me. After years of controversy, hearings, listening to people, making adjustments, and uh, dealing with controversial uh, ballot measures, the final step was initiative measure O, which would remove only some of the diverters. We fought to defeat it and we won, but traffic problems remain and will increase as state mandates to build 9,000 new housing units in Berkeley kick in. 
Yes. Um, so looking back on your, thank you, looking back on your time in office, um, what projects or initiatives are you most proud of? Well, that's a, that's a big question. Um, for me, the passage of the Landmarks Preservation Ordinance and creation of a waterfront park are closely tied together because of the work that Roz and Albert Leposky did through urban care. It was their work that laid the foundation for defeat of a huge shopping mall proposed for the waterfront and the future creation of McLaughlin East Shore Park and in support of the Landmarks Ordinance. They have never been recognized and are the true heroes in history. All of us that came after were just helpers in making their dream a reality. But I'm very, very proud of obtaining funding for the Berkeley Repertory Theater and establishment of the Arts and Theater District downtown that brought so many rewards and national recognition to the city of Berkeley. And of bringing the wall that heals to the Ho Chi Minh Park area, now known as Civic Center Park. I shall never forget when I read some of the 58,000 names on, on the wall at 3 a.m. in the morning and seeing the reactions of people as they ran their fingers over the names of the loved ones to, and to talk with them and he, feel that they really felt healed about this war that had been so controversial. I also am pleased of obtaining funding for the I-80 at pedestrian overpass when everybody said it couldn't be done and laboriously working out all the minute little details so that it could be built. And everyone, including the disabled, could enjoy both aquatic and McLaughlin parks. And of facilitating the restoration of the Marin Circle Fountain and Walk, the largest privately funded public works project that ever happened in the city of Berkeley. And of working to heal the wounds left felt by the Hispanic, Hispanic community by moving their long neglected and hidden veterans monument to the front of the Veterans Memorial Building and naming the city's waterfront park to honor Cesar Chavez and of aiding the lagging economy in West Berkeley by bringing the pyramid alehouse and restaurant into the area. It was a time of progress a time of meeting some of the challenges and a time of making some progress in the city of Berkeley. Thank you. So um, looking back, what would you say you learned from the opportunities and challenges during your time in the Berkeley politics? I think there's a common denominator amongst all of us and that is listening to the people. So I would advise Never, never, ever forget that our government is for, of, and by the people, that people are the greatest resource that Berkeley has or any city has, and that everything you do is not done alone. Base every act on what is best for the city and, on, and not on your advancement to higher political office or political favors. Or put them another way, to be a mayor or council member or whatever. Don't be a politician. Be yourself and true to your ideals and listen to the people. Thank you. Um, so I will echo uh, a, a question that Lincoln asked of Lonnie about um, what, uh, sorry, my dog was <laughs> barking. Um, about what motivated you to become a politician despite the stresses. Um, and uh, would you like to speak to that question a little bit about what, uh, what helped you, what fortified you for the, the stressful job of being a Berkeley politician? Yes, I'll try. Although I don't know that there's ever really a good answer to that question. My father was just opening a small business when he unexpectedly died. I was 10, my sister was 12. My mother had always been a homemaker and had no marketable skills. 
We were homeless for a while, but came to California where she got a job and worked hard every single day of her life as a single parent to overcome any obstacle, including helping me get through UC Berkeley without any outside financial help. Sure, I worked, but we worked together. However, I do want to correct one thing in your question. I never wanted, sought, or felt I had a career in politics. I was just a person trying to correct a wrong in my neighborhood with no political ambitions over and above helping the city that I loved so very, very much. And I really want to thank you for holding this forum and for letting all of us speak. Thank you very much, Janine, and the rest of the Berkeley Historical Society. Well, thank you. So I'll turn the mic over to Lincoln for our final panelist. Thank you, Janine. Um, this final panelist is not a lot, lot of mayor, but um, here's a brief intro to Marty Schiffenbauer, who he's lived in Berkeley for over 50 years, and he helped in write to write and collect signatures for the first Berkeley Citizen Initiative, which is a repeal of a regressive utility tax in 1971. Throughout the 70s and 80s, he played a major role in several successful residential and commercial rent control initiatives. And in 1982, he's responsible for the initiative that switched Berkeley's municipal elections date from April to coincide with the November general elections, which is credited with a significant advance in participation of voters. It saved the city money, and the voter turnout dramatically made a difference for a city that otherwise you know, might have trouble getting all of its electorate to participate in the decisions. In 1982, for his work on citizen initiatives, he was officially declared a, quote, super citizen by the city Council. So I'm going to introduce Berkeley super citizen Marty Schiffenbauer. And uh, the first question I got for you is you have to craft residential rent control measures that won in 72. What lessons did you learn from that campaign? Marty? Marty? Bueller? Marty, you're muted. Marty. Hold on. Am I doing are. good now? Now good. All right. <laughs> um, so uh, thanks for the introduction. One correction, the initiative, I, I'm not quite sure if I heard you correctly, but the April uh, 71 was my first initiative, not the first initiative. In right. Berkeley. Um, so I, First, let me say that I, I was at the exhibit yesterday with my wife, and it's a real tribute to David. Uh, I'm sure he would be thrilled, and it's kind of a memorial to him that uh, all this this entire collection was is really featured. And uh, I should say that David also wrote a history of Berkeley in the 1970s and 1980s, and you can find it online. Just Google David Munstock, and uh, you'll find it. Um, uh, at the exhibit, I, I went there with my wife and she was amazed to see that there was a poster that she drew up uh, for the uh, 1982 uh, Elmwood commercial rent control campaign. And uh, it was supposed to be on buses and it was on, uh, on a few buses, but some of them didn't run through Berkeley, unfortunately. Um, uh, David was an ally, a friend for many, many years. And uh, it's really sad that you know, he didn't get to see uh, this exhibit. Um, uh, the other thing I, I wanted to say is that, you know, it's really an honor uh, to be on this panel with all these mayors and I, I'm not quite sure how I fit in. Uh, maybe it's because back in the day, like the mayors, uh, half of Berkeley hated me uh, <laughs> at one point or another. So uh, I don't know, maybe that's one thing we have in common. Um, so to answer your questions, um, what I learned, the first thing that I learned is, uh, you know, that you have to write a law that's going to be declared constitutional. And June, we didn't really know what we were doing very much in 1972. Uh, but um, uh, we did, it, it did sort of work in a way in that when the courts ruled it unconstitutional, they essentially told us 
how to write a correct rent control. And that's what we did. Uh, and finally it passed in June, 1980. Of course, before that, we were helped by uh, Prop 13 passing and that in November 1978, we did Measure I, which returned uh, you know, 80% of landlords' property tax savings to tenants and also to commercial tenants. Most people don't realize that the no November 1978 law uh, covered commercial tenants as well as residential tenants. Uh, the other lesson, it's a lesson I didn't learn, <laughs> And uh, that was uh, a lesson about turnout. And you mentioned the, my switching uh, Berkeley's election date, which amazingly I was able to do uh, quite easily without a whole bunch of help. And it, it got 68% of the vote and I didn't even run a campaign. Uh, if, yes, people, if they want fewer elections and uh, saves the city money, they will vote for it, uh, both progressives and non-progressives. So that lesson about turnout, you know, what happened then in June uh, 1980, uh, when, uh, you know, rent control passed, you know, it, it passed by a lot, but, you know, the city council nonetheless could never get a majority. And uh, like in 72, okay, they couldn't get a majority in 73. I mean, so we would win initiatives when the initiatives were run during uh, November or even a June primary that was some, you know, uh, exciting stuff on the ballot. But April, it, it really, we just couldn't get that and uh, couldn't get a majority. We had sort of a partial majority when Carol Davis kind of switched over. And so I was on the rent board. Uh, I was appointed to the rent board by Veronica Fuchsen in 1980. And uh, we lost in 1981, and it was uh, a really, you know, big defeat. I thought we had great candidates. We did a great campaign, and nonetheless, there was no turnout. And so I, I resigned from the rent board, and I said, you know, this is crazy. So it took 10 years for me to learn that lesson <laughs> to switch Berkeley's election from April to November. And just to add to that, you know, uh, Gus mentioned Virginia. And, you know, I don't understand why uh, Democrats don't switch those election dates where they can, and they can do it if they have control of the government, which was the case in Virginia. They can do it now in New Jersey, uh, you know, uh, Murphy almost lost. And in many states, you can do it, even if the Republicans control the state government, you can do it via initiative. And so, um, uh, I, I don't understand why they don't do it. I've actually sent a proposal out to all sorts of people. And I uh, once went to a conference and they said, well, we can't change the rules in the middle of the, you know, that's ridiculous. The Republicans are changing all the election <laughs> rules and voter suppression and we can change the rules, get a bigger turnout. So I doubt anybody uh, of great influence is listening to this, but if they are, uh, talk to those people in all of those states that have off year elections and, and especially odd year elections and move it. Uh, so that's kind of the lesson I didn't learn. Um, and maybe I'll, I'll stop here. You can go on to the next question. You, you, you alluded to sort of how it, it, com commercial rent control is often overlooked as a factor. Most people think of rent control and think of, you know, people living in apartment buildings, but the, there's also a whole sort of tail wagging the dog aspect of that there's commercial rent control, which certainly has not been as much in the forefront, but yet I know that that's a subject that you feel pretty strongly about and have been involved with. Can you talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, so uh, there's a kind of write up at the exhibit um, that just, uh, yeah. So um, that talks about how uh, commercial rent control came in the Elmwood district. And basically, you know, uh, I was Ozzy's, which he was a beloved character in the Elmwood and had run his fountain forever and ever and a World War II fighter pilot. And, uh, and so uh, Barbara Lubin was sitting outside uh, trying to collect signatures to save Ozzy because he was threatened with eviction and a big, huge rent increase. And at that time, again, as I mentioned, the city council would not go for any kind of commercial rent control or anything to save Aussies. And so I suggested to Barbara Lubin, 
uh, your petition, which I will certainly sign, but it's not going to go anywhere. And why don't we do commercial rent control? And again, as I mentioned, I knew that you could have commercial rent control because uh, the November, as I said, the November 1978 law covered commercial tenants and it actually went to court. Uh, and the lower courts said it was okay. It never went to the higher courts because Measure I was only, it only lasted a year as so they didn't want to bother, you know, appealing it. And so again, we got together with Myron Moskowitz and we worked on it and it, it passed quite easily. Um, I think it was about 62% of the vote. Um, now, a lot of people think that, you know, it was knocked out uh, by, uh, you know, the court said it was declared unconstitutional. And, and of course it wasn't. What happened was that the Elma rent control was, everybody loved it and it never was even challenged in court. But the city council went ahead and uh, expanded it, Telegraph Avenue and to West Berkeley. And when that happened, <laughs> the landlords really got excited, particularly one landlord in Telegraph Avenue area on the, the famous cafe right across from Bolt Hall, which is now no longer Bolt Hall. And uh, uh, they fought. They they fought in court, and uh, uh, they didn't they didn't th feel that they would win in court. And then eventually, uh, what happened? Uh, one provision was knocked out, but not the entire law. And so they were smart enough to go to the state legislature, and not only did they ban commercial rent control for Berkeley, they banned it for the entire state. And uh, so that was the the demise, but it still did a lot of good in certainly in the Elma district. They lasted, I think it was about five and a half years and Dazi remained uh, until he retired. Um, a lot of the commercial tenants in that, uh, in the Elma district were able to buy uh, uh, their, you know, the property that their businesses were on. And so they never had to worry about rent increases again. Um, so it did have an important effect. Uh, of course, the negative was uh, you know, they banned it for the whole state. Now, there's been some talk over the years um, about bringing back commercial rent control, and uh, it certainly could happen if enough commercial tenants really get, you know, say, hey, we've got to do something about this. And as residential rents have gone up, so have commercial rents, and you have a lot of small businesses that uh, are replaced by big chains and, and you know, Berkeley has tried to stop that through zoning to some degree, uh, but you know, again, it, it's pretty hard. And so uh, I'm hoping that at some point commercial rent control will come back. And it, it definitely there's, there's no constitutional issue as long as you write the law um, you know, correctly and give landlords a fair return. Um, so I guess that's kind of what I was gonna say. Uh, Great. Uh, do you any other reflections on sort of, I mean, since you've been here for a long time and been been knee deep in Berkeley politics, what would you say are sort of the, the biggest strengths and the biggest weaknesses of sort of being an activist in Berkeley? Well, you know, I sort of, um, uh, you know, I'm not, I haven't been much of an activist recently. <laughs> Uh, although I vote all the time and of course still very progressive and uh, support rent control. Um, I don't know, you know, the, the big issues now and, and I kind of agree with Shirley more on this and didn't much agree with her back in the 70s and 80s about, you know, the, the sort of push to build a lot more in Berkeley. And, uh, and so I, I kind of think you know, this whole idea, they just, there was just a building torn down. Uh, it was over a hundred year old building, or at least they, I don't know if it's torn down yet, but they voted to tear it down and put up some condos. And, and so I kind of think, you know, what one thing that people are not thinking about in Berkeley and certainly in, in other coastal places, they're not thinking about, you know, climate change. And there's some big developments that's supposed to going, be going up in the marina. And it's kind of crazy. Those places are going to be flooded. And uh, a lot, all those buildings now they want to build on 4th Street, uh, um, across some Spangers, and of course, uh, Native Americans are against it. And that is likely to be flooded. And we just had this super rain. And uh, once the oceans are getting warmer and you're getting more water vapor in the air, and you're going to have a lot more storms like that. And we've seen big storms with flooding in, in all kinds of places. So, 
I don't know. I mean, definitely need more housing, but there are other places I think that are better than Berkeley. Uh, uh, and Berkeley is pretty dense and, and just, I was at the marina today taking a walk and coming back and there's massive numbers of these big buildings. And, and I don't know if they even are full of tenants. So, but Berkeley politics have really changed. And, and I should mention that, you know, after the election date changed, the, um, uh, I think Shirley and, and some of my friends, in fact, decided that uh, this was too favorable to the progressives. And so they ended up uh, changing it to, uh, you know, district elections, which I don't know, it's harder, I think, to get stuff done with district elections, um, uh, you know, because each council member is very much in tune with their district and not maybe looking at the entire uh, uh, city, what the city can need. Now, oh. You know, district elections obviously have some some things in favor. It in San Francisco, I think it's worked well. But um, so I'm not quite sure. Um, things have really changed. Rent control is no longer the big issue, and that was, of course, my big issue. Um, and uh, of course, the state came in and weakened it, and also like they didn't get rid of it, like commercial rent control. So uh, I guess I don't know. Uh, and certainly we're still progressive in terms of social issues and uh, it's still a very progressive city, very tolerant city, and uh, I don't expect to move. <laughs> thanks. thanks, Marty. I, yeah. I want to thank all of you for your service here. I mean, this is, this is not an easy city to run. I don't know what city is, but um, everybody's been involved in some aspect or another trying to make Berkeley a better place. And that was, you know, that was David Munstock's commitment. I mean, he really cared about the city. He really loved the fact that this was a, a, a wild and crazy mix of people. And he was really committed to seeing it move forward. And so I feel honored that David you know, picked me to help shepherd his collection, just as there are many other collections in, in the city. I mean, collections are built by individuals that then migrate up the food chain through through archival consultants such as myself into institutions that can better take care of them, better share them. And so all of you out there um, can play a role in helping to build our own history. And so if you have piles of stuff, small or large, think about them and don't throw stuff away. And you know, collections such as David's are, are really important to adding to our coherence of what, what happened and where we can move forward and what, the, what are the lessons to be learned. So I think this concludes the presentation section. We can now move on to questions from the audience. So I'll turn this over to my Berkeley Historical Society colleagues. Thank you. Well, the first question I believe was um, relevant to what you were just saying. Uh, how many other such collections do you know of if not as grand, still or one, still or once compiled by an individual. Also, if anyone else knows of collections, uh, you might uh, volunteer that. Well, well I'll, I'll start with my, my area of expertise is posters. And a, a Berkeley resident who was an activist during the free speech movement, Michael Rossman, built up a giant collection of 24,000 posters that, that ended up going to the Oakland Museum of California. And they're all available online. Um, people can build up collections. I'm working with a collection right now that's Oakland based, but it's mostly Chicano and Latino posters that will end up going to you know, a, a local institution. Um, there are a lot of these collections where people have stuff and sometimes they just, oh, it's a small handful of things, but very often they're unique objects. And uh, through, the, through the role of historians and archival curation, they can be better placed so that they can add to our wealth. I mean, the, the Bancroft Library, you know, we, the, you know, we live in a town with one of the, with the most, you know, important public interest, public research university in the country. And it has incredible libraries and resources and archives. And so, I mean, you know, I've helped shepherd collections that have gone to the, the, you know, Asian library. I've helped shepherd collections going to the ethnic studies library. There are a lot of opportunities for these collections to go somewhere. Once they're in an institution, they can then have a, a, a further life. But that's a lot of what I do right now as an archival consultant. 
Janine, do you want to handle more questions? There's not a whole lot waiting in the chat. Okay. Um, uh, I, I, uh, I think I'm not the best person to speak because um, I have someone here repairing a, a roof that sprang a leak over in our last storm. That's why I've been very brief in my comments. Uh, I have someone sawing <laughs> nearby. So I'm gonna let um, somebody else do, do uh, the questions. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I thank have you. And for you, Jenny, um, talk a little bit about the oral history project that you guys are doing at the Berkeley Historical Society. I think that's extremely important. So many people that remember the 50s and the 60s in Berkeley yeah. are no longer with us. And I would love to see what we can do in terms of recruiting volunteers to help do some of those um, oral histories and develop a protocol so that we'd be getting the same information from people, that sort of thing. Um, if Berkeley is a place where things begin, it's also a place where we can study the process of social change, I think. Yes, um, thank you. So uh, Lonnie and Gus and Shirley have all um, been interviewed, although we haven't quite finished that process. We hope to do another interview with you, Lonnie, and uh, Shirley gave us written answers. But um, you're right. This this time it's amazing but the, the the number of people whom we wished we had interviewed about this time period but can no longer is is is, is a, yeah very uh sobering and um the same you mentioned that the 50s i mean i i wish that we could have interviewed people about the mccarthy era um yeah. and and um we did interview people about the free speech movement and that was that was very interesting there are there are some um, interviews on our website for that. And um, in terms of going forward, we, we do have a new um, volunteer who is looking for people to interview. So if, if you know of people whom you think should be interviewed, um, you can email, well, you can, Lonnie, you know my email. You can any any of those who have spoken with you can email me or you can e email info at berkeleyhistoricalsociety.org um, if you have ideas for people who who should be interviewed. And um, okay. yes, yes. So we're, we're we're doing video interviews mostly, and we put them on our website. It's a it's a YouTube channel um, that you can that we link to on our website, and um, I I think it is very important. Yeah. Yeah, that I think. Whoops. Can I? I did just want to add, and I didn't have a chance to before. I want to thank Lincoln, and I want to thank the Historical Society for putting the exhibit together and the work you're doing. Um, it would make David very happy to know that his work is being shared, and he put so much of his life into trying to make Berkeley the absolutely best place it could be. So. Thank you for David. <laughs> Can I, um, am I unmuted? Um, uh, yes. I, I would, is there a way uh, that, are you gonna tell people how to get a recording of this, how to access it? Because I know it's being recorded. Yeah, we have a YouTube channel and after a little editing, we'll uh, put this up there. So yeah. Just go to your YouTube channel. Right, which, and also we, um, <clears throat> We usually link, you know, you could go to our website and find a link to our YouTube channel, presumably. And um, Great, yeah. I wanted to mention that before all the video uh, oral history interviews, a lot of oral history interviews were done on, you know, little cassette tapes, but then transcribed. So we do have bound volumes of all kinds of history from, uh, you know, before the 1970s. And um, from the chat, we have uh, an interesting comment uh, with it ends in a question hearing all this makes me yearn for days past i heard ron Dellum say the movement sent him to washington and then late in his tenure he turned around and the movement was gone it seems today that lots of policy in berkeley is driven by the real estate and yimby lobby any thoughts 
I, I can say something about it. Uh, I just actually read an article in uh, today's Chronicle about the big battles in San Francisco, the MBs versus the NIMBYs and, and their various lots and Nordstrom lot where they want to build in the camp. San Francisco Board of Supervisors voted it down. But you know, it, the home prices in Berkeley are totally crazy. And, um, and that's not just true for Berkeley, of course, but the entire Bay Area and other parts uh, of the country. And um, I mentioned earlier about how half the half of Berkeley hated me at one point, and <laughs> and probably the the most hatred, most death threats I ever got was in 1989, where I came up with a proposal. Now I didn't write it or anything; it was just in a gossip column in the uh, East Bay Express to control home prices as well as rents. And um, I'm still thinking, you know, there is there's probably no way Berkeley can do it, of course, as a city all alone, but uh, state might be able to do it through, uh, you know, requiring when home prices go up a huge amount, requiring much bigger down payments and stuff. But that's a huge problem. And it isn't just supply. There's a huge amount of speculation that goes on. And many of the people who buy these homes for all cash and pay ridiculous amounts are never, never going to live there. They're flippers. And, um, and it's true in Berkeley. It's true in other places. So that it's you know, just building more housing is not going to solve the problem of out of control home prices and unaffordable homes uh, in Berkeley and elsewhere. So that's my two cents about that. Well, I have some two cents too. You may remember, Marty, and back in the 70s, we worked for, I think it was 12 years to get a limited equity co-op at Savo Island. And it was always just a struggle to keep the funding out because it was so hard to finance. It's still there and it's beautiful. What it does is it takes the speculation out. A, a real question as to whether anybody would want to do it anymore because people see their home as their bonanza for retirement right now. But there are other forms of home ownership, co-ops and limited equity co-ops in particular. And I think this is an area where we're evolving. I came in, in many ways as being active in the neighborhood movement too. We had ticky tack apartments, soft story, ugly things going in all over uh, my neighborhood, South Berkeley. And I remember a BART official coming and talking to the LeConte Neighborhood Association and saying it was gonna be all apartment buildings in our area and you people can't keep Berkeley an overgrown small town forever. And as you know, we all thought about that and said, you wanna make a bet, <laughs> right? And for many years, and, and I will tell you up till the time I was mayor, you couldn't put two bricks together in Berkeley without having people um, protest Sue, um, even on lots similar to the situation in San Francisco where they want to take a parking lot and put in housing, including a hundred units of affordable housing. So I think the NIMBYs are filling a void. It used to be just NIMBYs. Now NIMBYs and NIMBYs fight it out. And if we can have a good conversation, maybe we can get to some better ways of doing it. Personally, Tom and I just put an ADU in our backyard. We're running to a young professor. Um, I think ADUs, which were highly controversial at one time, nobody wanted to desecrate single family zoning with an ADU, are part of an answer. You could add another third to your population easily. Um, and keep your neighborhood landscape, which is what I think we all value and our, our classic architecture. So um, I, I, I think it's so old hat to talk about development as all right or all wrong. Let's get, let's get Berkeley, let's get creative. My well, two. 
Thank you, Lonnie. Um, Ken Stein would like to. Shirley Dean has been trying to ask a question. Oh, sorry. Uh, well, I, who? Shirley Dean wants to ask a question. She's oh, okay. got her hand up. No, okay. I didn't want to ask a question. I wanted to make a statement. Yeah. Um, I really um, agree with what Marty Schiffenbauer said about the price of land. It's gone well beyond ADUs in your backyard because under the current state mandates, which began January 1st, 2022, they can split single family lots and where one, uh, one house had formerly existed, they can build a total of four units on each split. And without any review, without any notice to neighborhoods, and they can also build uh, along transit corridors, four-story buildings. Now, you know, it, we have to address the issues of climate change. There's no doubt about it. it but we are, what is it, uh, almost eight to nine square miles. Our borders are fixed. We have no real vacant land in this city. We, are, we have um, extreme hazardous fire areas designated. We have a designated earthquake fault by the California uh, Seismic uh, Agency. We have landslides designated by that same agency. We have sea level rise to deal with. And I note that uh, in San Francisco, they're going to have to raise the Embarcadero by seven feet to deal with sea level rise. Um, our own coastline is suffering and will suffer those same consequences. And we have a sinking um, area in West Berkeley uh, that's due to the weight of the development that already exists. These are facts that we cannot turn our backs away from. And we have to have an answer in order to deal with the speculation that is now occurring. I get at least 10 calls a day for somebody who wants to buy my home, as is, no money, uh, cash offer. And there's this going on to everybody in many areas of the city of Berkeley. We are facing this 7,700 units to 9,000 new, uh, new units that have to be developed in the city of Berkeley by state mandate in the next eight years. It is time not just to have a conversation, but it is time to begin to put our heads together as to how we are going to meet this demand because it is threatening many dangerous areas in the city of Berkeley, putting many lives at, at risk, and we need to find some real answers. We have lots of vacant units in the city of Berkeley built in market rate housing. Those need to be uh, converted to affordable housing because that's where the real crisis is, is in affordable housing. And we need to find a way to develop with the university meeting their demand every year for more and more students. You know that they have not counted the 7,000 students who live in university dorms as even living in the city of Berkeley in a housing unit. That needs to be changed because they count too. And I don't know how people came up with some of these numbers, but we need to not only find a way to meet growth in the city of Berkeley, but we also need to find a way to straighten out the statistics that are being used to put forward these development plans. This is a very, very serious issue. And it is being run by the Yimbis who will, if you dare to say, we can't make that kind of, uh, we can't meet the kind of uh, standard that says 9,000 new units in the city of Berkeley, they will call you a racist. But yet if you ask them, where are we gonna put all these people? How are they gonna live? How, what will happen to the traffic flow? Where will happen to public safety in terms of earthquakes and fires and sea level rise, et cetera? There are no real answers. 
So we have to mobilize as a community to find the direction that the city is going to go in over these next few years. And we don't have much time. We have no time in terms of climate meeting the demands of climate action, and we have no uh, time to meet the demands from the State uh, Department of um, Development. So we need to really work hard on this issue as our number one priority in the city of Berkeley. Okay, thank you. Um, a couple of people, Phil Allen and Carla Woodworth have put in the chat something about um, maybe maybe that mandate, I guess it implies that maybe that mandate for 9,000 units can be uh, um, reversed through a state initiative process. So we'll see. There's talk of that. There is talk of that to return zoning control, land use right. control to the city rather than let the state handle it from above. So anyone who's concerned about that should look into that. Uh, Ken Stein, you want to speak? We're almost out of time. Oh, I mean, we have 10 minutes left. And you, first, you need to unmute yourself. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Good. Uh, thank you, Shirley. And thank you for your comments about People's Park. Uh, as someone who's lived in the city for uh, 53 years, it's been sad for me. I think a lot of times old people go, oh, things were better in the olden days. Well, I, to me, it's been really sad to see Berkeley turning more and more from what was once a beautiful hometown, horizontal city to a vertical city. Uh, it's really a lot of outside developers, big money developers, junk apartments being built for students that are tiny little prison cells uh, in the name of, of progress. Uh, to me, it's so similar to what the nation went through with, quote, redevelopment. It was a shuck and jive that came down in the 50s that destroyed communities, that destroyed livability of communities, that destroyed light and air and views and all of these things that make a community livable. To me, it's been a tremendous source of irony that in the olden days we had we were successful in the 70s and, and I was there working on this and, and being successful in a lot of ways, keeping uh, older commercial structures from being knocked down uh, before any kind of hearing uh, for history or, or impacts on community. Uh, and now that's all turned around. It's an irony that in the olden days it was BCA and Shirley and her, her crowd were, were sort of pro all this development. We were opposed to it. And now it's the quote, more progressive forces. I don't think they're progressive at all. Uh, really giving the green light to the university to build millions of square feet of, of just garbage in our community. Uh, and and this, this myth of the need for student housing when it's not a need for student housing, there's tens of thousands of units of student housing. What there is, is the need for the university to get more money to increase enrollment so that they can build bigger and, and have bigger impacts in our community. And to see our, our current mayor uh, going along with this and giving a green light to all this stuff and, and the community being sold a bill of goods about green development, I, I just see it as, uh, as bogus. And I thank Shirley for her efforts. And also I'll give a, a hat tip to Trudy Washburn. I had a nice conversation with her about a few years ago about all of this. And so thank you for that. One of the comments in the chat was, it's interesting that none of our current city council members are present for this, but uh, maybe we know why. Uh, uh, anybody else want to get back into the history side of things, what was going on 40 years ago? Um, uh, Gus, would, or Gus, would you like to comment on um, the housing problem? Well, well yeah, I'll go back to the history because I remember when I first came on the Berkeley scene, there were a lot of... Uh, statements and people who own housing that you're never to sell this house to a person of color, to a black person. Then blacks could not live north of uh, what is now MLK Way, I forget the name, Grove, I guess it was, in the city of Berkeley. Berkeley, just prior to Ron Delms coming on council, was basically a Republican city. Talk about gentrification, black population, like 27, 30% during the time that I was mayor is now down to 6%. Things are going on we don't even speak to. You know, Berkeley also is a city that's only nine square miles. So you can't just keep pushing stuff into it without real thought and analysis 
and understand the environment and whatever else. And I look at all these market rate condos going up and all the buildings being built in Berkeley. And I've said all along, during this pandemic age, a lot of people are not coming back to the workforce, so they're not going to move into those. As Shirley said, they could make this affordable housing. We could put solar panels on the top to create energy and a variety of other things. Where is the thinking of what Berkeley was once going? I see some of you here nodding your heads and you're citizens of Berkeley, but where is that movement? Where is that kinds of discussion this then? Thirdly, as somebody said, I'm sort of sick of, of, of Jesse, who I endorsed the first time he ran our current president, going along with all this massive development and whatever else. And it's like, these people still claim to be good progressives. There's a time to stand up, people. The time is now. Thank you. Yeah. Can I uh, uh, chip in here? Like um, Alani's idea of limited equity housing, because she knows I, I do live in a in limited equity housing. Um, you know, maybe some of these developments, uh, rather than saying we'll give a certain number of uh, units for low income, uh, you can make a whole development that's a limited equity housing development. And no one's ever come up with that that idea that I've heard of. And maybe Berkeley could do something like that, be the first that to create a, uh, a new building, which is limited equity housing. So people get some equity, not a lot, but at least it stays affordable forever. And rather than 20% or 30%, it would be 100%. Well, your building, Marty, is 100% because the owner of the building decided to do that, right? I think well, so, Jack Sawyer. Isn't that no, building? What, what happened was but, that um, someone but saw the building. But Savo was, Island was a city financed right. project. And there's nothing in the law keeping us from doing that. And there's nothing keeping us from having building standards that would require solar or rooftop gardens or a lot of things that would actually help the environment. Um, so I think let's think of some, let's think of some legislation. You're good at that. A number of us have worked on it. Berkeley can challenge some state laws by having its own legislation and being prepared to defend it. Uh, Berkeley can talk to its elected officials, Congress, legislature and ask them to carry some amendments to existing laws that we think are problematic. I really share the concern, honestly, about speculators and small units. And I, I'm wondering, I know that Berkeley's been thinking about a tenant opportunity to purchase law. I don't, I'm not sure how that would work. I'm sure there's difficulties, but it's an interesting idea, it's a good idea in many ways. And um, maybe the city housing trust fund could help them and they could be limited equity co-ops. You know, we need, um, we need to write some good push it. And Carla, I saw what you just wrote about Yimby's Control Sacramento. Woohoo, they sure took it over in a couple of years, didn't they? It used to be only NIMBYs. That was the only voice you ever heard and nothing much got built. And a lot of it was made even more difficult. And so, so I don't know, gang. I think that again, it, there, if, if you can think of a solution, you can write a law to get it done and then you have to get the funding to help it happen. That's what we need to do. Yeah, I, I mean, the idea, the Savo Island thing was, was built, but the idea of uh, limited equity housing, I mean, the city could actually buy buildings and turn them existing buildings without new construction and make them limited it, equity housing. You know what? They could. And with all the money that's coming down for supportive housing, and homeless housing right now, we ought to be out there. Again, I'm not sure, I don't know what the city's doing, but a bunch of people interested in that topic ought to ask the city what it's doing because I was told by um, 
a, a person who works in Sacramento who was part of the student movement back in the 60s. Huh. You now a, a financial person, somebody you know too. But was that the question isn't money anymore. There is so much money coming from the state and federal government for housing. The question is political will. And I think here again, we can all complain up the wazoo, but it makes sense to figure out where we want to go and try to get there. That's how we got commercial control back in the day, right? So think about it. I think we need to think about it that way. Well, thank you for those um, thoughts, uh, all of you. Um, certainly the city does face really um, serious both high rent control, high, high rent and uh, not enough apartments and needs definitely some new alternatives. Um, and I know a lot of people are thinking about this and I don't know if the Berkeley Historical Society can be part of um, this uh, conversation. I know there are people who have a lot of experience and um, maybe we'll have, we'll follow up on this, but um, Thank you all for joining us today um, and uh, putting your ideas out there, your reflections, um, and giving us some perspective on where we've come from uh, and helping us think about where we're going. And um, we, I, again, I invite you, if you have ideas of people whom uh, we should interview for oral histories, you can send them to info at berkeleyhistoricalsociety.org and um, we will continue to, to try and um, archive these important people and their work. And so, thank, you. thank you for doing this. Yeah, thanks a lot. Okay, yes. well, thank all of you who participated and those of you who joined us and we will um, be having another event, I think quite soon, um, beginning of December when Tina Jones Williams is sharing her memoir, it happened on our watch about growing up in Berkeley in the sixties and seventies. So um, you. Oh, you just muted yourself. <laughs> oh, you should get an email about that soon, about that uh, coming up either uh, December 2nd or 5th, I believe. If okay, you're on well, our email list and if you're not on our email list, send an email. <laughs> to that same address <laughs> thing. Yes, yeah. so you'll, you'll find out about it. Okay, all right, well, thank you. Thank you all. Adieu, bye-bye. Stay safe. Bye.